Through his adoption into the fictional works of Robert E. Howard, the god known as Krom has become an almost household name. Even before this, he was well known throughout Ireland, mostly due to the sensational tales of St. Patrick. He has long been connected to Lunasa, which is commonly known as Crom du Sunday, connected to hill climbing and celebrations on the last Sunday of July, or the first Sunday of August. Who really is this Crom Cruach, and what connection does he have to the festival of Lunasa and Tyrannus, the thunder god of the Gauls? Hi friends, I'm Kevin McLean. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and consider supporting me through Patreon or PayPal. Your support helps me to make in-depth videos like this that take a long time to put together, so your support is much appreciated. The most important source of information on Krom Kruch comes from the Dinshenhas entry for Mag Schlecht, where it says, Here used to stand a lofty idol that saw many a fight, whose name was Krom Kruch. It caused every tribe to live without peace, alas, for its secret power. The valiant Gael used to worship it. Not without tribute did they ask of it to satisfy them with their share in the hard world. He was their god, the wizened Krom, hidden by many mists. For him ingloriously they slew their hapless firstborn with much wailing and peril, to pour their blood round Krom Kruch. Milk and corn they asked of him, speedily in return for a third part of their progeny. Great was the horror and the outcry about him. Hither came Tirnmas, prince of distant tower, one Samhain eve. With all his host, the deed was a source of sorrow to them. They stirred evil, they beat palms, they bruised bodies, wailing to the demon who held them thralls. They shed showers of tears, weeping prostrate. Dead the men, void of sound strength, the host of Banva, with the land wasting Tirmas in the north through the worship of Krom Kruach, hard their hap. Ranged in ranks stood idols of stone four times three. To beguile the host, grievously the figure of Krom was formed of gold, since the kingship of Erevon, bounteous chief, worship was paid to stones till the coming of noble Patrick of Ardmacha. This account has some common features with others, minus the claim of human sacrifice. A version from the life of St. Patrick, predating the Dinshenhas by several hundred years, says, And the King Loigara, being devoted to the worship of devils, adored a certain idol, magnificently formed of silver and gold, and which was raised in a field called Magfled, and the idol was named Kenkrothi, that is, the head of all the gods. For that it was, by that foolish people, accounted to utter responses. And around this image stood twelve inferior gods, made of brass, as if subject unto it. Though using a slightly different name, it refers to the same idol. The remains of it are now known as the Kili Klogan Stone from the Irish Col Achlogan, Forest of the Stone. Legend describes its desecration to St. Patrick, but it probably happened much later. The earliest legend suggests that St. Patrick caused the stone to lean by extending his staff towards it from a nearby hill, and the power of God struck it over. But most likely, it had been in a tilted position for hundreds of years before Christianity even existed. The stone is decorated with Le Ten period artwork, linking it to the mainland Celtic artistic style, but it may have been decorated long after the stone had become an idol to the god. This tilted posture gave rise to the name Krom, meaning slanted, tilted, or bent. Later accounts in folklore give the name Krom Du or Krom Kruach. Kruach means a heap, stack, rick, or mound. And it's used also for mountains of a particular shape, such as Kruchen Eile, 
more well known today as Crow Patrick. Du is taken now to mean black, but the earliest explanation for this name was given by Brianna Luni, a 19th century Irish language history and archaeology professor at the Catholic University of Ireland. He had participated in the festival of Crom Du in August of 1844 and inquired into the name. He was told by the participants that Du meant sacrifice and that it was the sacrifice of Crom. Though an incorrect etymology, it demonstrates that the name was not believed to be related to blackness and the spelling provided by Oluni is Dua rather than Du. Du or Dua means a mound or rampart of a royal site. The Christian god is described in Old Irish as to the king of the clouds and the holy rampart. It is perhaps from Proto-Indo-European dom, meaning house, come to mean mound or rampart in reference to the Celtic royal fortresses situated atop such mounds and hills. Thus, Crom Du is simply a description, the tilting stone of the mound, and both Crom Cruach and Crom Du mean the same thing. It's hard to see how the god could have been conceived of as dark or black, for all accounts agree that his likeness was made of gold or gold and silver. The modern idea of Krom, which one gets from a quick internet search, is based around a false understanding of his name, which developed academically into a reconstructed myth about Lunasa. One of the most common is that Krom Du is a dark old fertility deity who does not wish to give up his produce. This god is defeated by a youthful god who wins the grain harvest. The story of St. Patrick attacking the idol and subsequent tales involving a struggle of Patrick and Crom Du are said to reflect this myth. However, the interpretation may be somewhat misguided based on a misunderstanding of the name. Lunasa comes from Lug Nasad, meaning the assembly of Lug. It was called the only high assembly in the Book of Leinster, suggestive of its heavenly character. Lug was the inventor of the Unach, a local summer festival that featured competitive sports, horse racing, public feasting of the first fruits, and the sacrifice of bulls. It was a demonstration of royal power, said to be the most important annual festival aside from Samhain. It was also a time when the ancestors were paid respects. Lug's wives, Nas and Bui, were honored. Taltu, Lug's foster mother, goddess of the fields, is given highest honors for her work in bringing forth the grains and preparing the fields. Given the time of year and the grain harvest, it's easy to see that the festival had a strong link to weather that was conducive to the grain harvest as well as sporting events. The royal site of Karamun has a local Lunasa tale. Karamun was the wife of the son of Diva, meaning destruction, son of darkness. No supply of grain appeased them. She came with her three sons, Dian, fierce, Du, black, Dotha, darkness, and began to ravage the land, destroying the sap in the ripening fruit. Lug Laivach, perhaps muddy Lug, Krichenvel, I, son of Olaf, and Behule, defeated the dark forces, driving them over the sea and capturing their mother. They made the Fomorians swear on heaven and earth and sea that they would not return. Carmen died and was buried amongst strong oaks, and Bress, son of Eletha, dug her grave. Though the tale is different, from other accounts, it honors a local goddess of the land in connection with Lu and other gods who ensure the protection of the harvest from forces of destruction, and is celebrated with horse racing, competitive games, and feasting. It shares strong similarities to the account in the Second Battle of Magturid, though they may have been separate events. Typically, the plain where Krom Du resided is known as Magslecht which is explained in the Dinshenhas as Field of Slaughter. 
However, it is first recorded as Magleket in the Chronicles of the Scots. In the Book of Magurin, it is called Lechtweige. Its original name would have been Maglecht, meaning Plain of the Gravestones, for which there are many in the area. Darirath Hill Fort stood nearby, the Fort of the Oaks. Standing stones were often believed to mark the sites of dead heroes or kings. One well-known example of this is Cúchulainn. He had himself propped up against such a stone before he died. The tale of Crum Cruach itself is a tale which links the stone to the death of the legendary king Tirmas, a name which may mean Pillar Lord. The festival of Lunasa, or Crom du Sunday, continued to be held in Magschlacht until the modern day. Though much of its origin had been forgotten, some ritual aspects remained, such as horse racing, picking bilberries, and laying flowers upon hills. These garlands were said to be laid in honor of Crom Du, and it is from this practice that the day in English is still sometimes called Garland Sunday. It could be that the covering of flowers over the hilltops is linked to the name Blodaiweth, Flower Face, the name of the wife of Thay in Welsh tales, or Blathneth, the love of Cúchulainn, or the wife of Knu Deril, the son of Lug. One of Lug's wives is named Barin, meaning a rocky hill. Perhaps, if the hill is covered in flowers, it becomes Flower Face. Of the festival, the metrical Din Shenha says, On the calends of August, free from reproach, they would go thither every third year. They would hold seven races for glorious objects seven days in the week. There they would discuss with strife of speech the dues and tributes of the province. Every legal enactment rightly, piously, every third year it was settled. Corn, milk, peace, happy ease, full nets, oceans plenty. Chieftains in amity with troops overbearing Erin, suing, harsh levying of debts, satirizing, quarreling misconduct, is not dared during the races. He brought the cornfields of the gales out of danger. He brought Erin out of a shipwreck. He raised the fair of Taltu from the sod. This refers to the High King of Taur, Mul Shechlin, who reinstated the Taltu celebration after it had been postponed for many, many years. But it expresses the ancient connection between the festival, the success of the crops, protection, and kingship. The seven races and seven days perhaps suggests a connection with the sun. The atmosphere of the festival is celebratory and joyful, though there was also ritualized mourning for the dead. One early account names the site of Krom as Magfleg, meaning Plain of the Feast, likely referring to the Lunasa period celebrations. This was a feast of the first fruits. The quantity produced was used to judge local farmers, but archaically it was also linked to cattle, following on particular pasturing activities. The links between the festival and cattle seem to be the reason why folk tales say Krom Du was in possession of a bull, or even turned himself into a bull. In the Book of Lechen it says, Three forbidden bloods Patrick preached against in the fair of Taltu, yoke oxen and slaying of milk cows, and the burning of the first fruits. These were originally sacrifices to the gods of the festival, and would have been consumed in a ritual feast, with some portions burned for gods of the sky. Into the early modern era, cattle were still being sacrificed in some more remote Gaelic regions, though dedicated to saints instead. This is the basis for the folklore around Crom Du and his bull, which is given to St. Patrick. The tale itself doesn't actually appear ancient, but rather as an explanation for the cult practices of the day, whose origins were largely forgotten, yet still practiced. This historical forgetfulness is how the day came to be known as Krom Du Sunday at all. 
Cattle are frequently sacrificial animals, but they are especially connected to the Indo-European sky god. Zeus and Jupiter received the sacrifice of white bulls. Pliny the Elder describes a Gaulish bull sacrifice. The Druids, that is what they call their magicians, hold nothing more sacred than the mistletoe, and a tree on which it is growing, provided that it is a Valonian oak. They prepare a ritual sacrifice and banquet beneath the tree, and bring up two white bulls whose horns are bound for the first time on this occasion. A priest arrayed in white vestments climbs the tree, and with a golden sickle cuts down the mistletoe, which is caught in a white cloak. Then finally they kill the victims, praying to a god to render his gift propitious to those on whom he has bestowed it. While many assume that he means the mistletoe berries, it may mean the plant itself, which is ground up into a medicinal salve or drink. The berries, after all, are poisonous to people. The mistletoe is held sacred because it grows upon the oak tree, the embodiment of the thunder god. This bull sacrifice and banquet described by Pliny may be connected to Lunasa. The bull sacrifice also played an important role in the selection of a king. A bull was killed, its meat consumed, and its hide was then worn and slept in by the one chosen to receive the prophecy. He would have a dream that would reveal who was to be the next king. The person becomes the bull by eating and wearing it, and is then connected to the god of the bull, who plays a decisive role in bestowing kingship. The god Lu is transformed into a young spotted bull by his servant, the lawgiver Moran, in revenge for Lug having slept with his wife. He is then forced to answer a series of riddles at sword point, which eventually ends with Moran establishing a punishment for wives who cheat on their husbands, which involves manure. Lug's daughter Deal is the master of cattle, said to have brought Fay and men to Ireland from her father's herd, which then gives rise to the name of the plain, Mag Femin. She is born at the same time as a cow, and perhaps her mother was Bui or Buach, one of the wives of Lug, whose name refers to a cow. When Bres is demanding the best cows of the Gales, Lug disguises the cattle by smearing them with ash, a protective charm against cattle sickness, and then he makes wooden cows filled with bog water to poison Bress. Lug's birth involves the retrieval of stolen cows in folklore, and his triumphant deed of slaying Balor was the culmination of the release of that cow, his mother. The name Ethnu, now pronounced Enya, which of all the gods Lug is most connected to, is related to the word Ethach, meaning cattle. She is thus the cow-like one. Lugith Laigde, or Lui Laigde, was an important high king and a founder of a tribe. Laigde seems to be from Loigde, meaning young bull god. All medieval accounts call Krom Kruach the chief idol of the Gaels. It says that he saw many combats and he caused the tribes to live without peace, suggesting he ruled over war. But he's also asked to ensure food and milk. Some connect his worship by Tirnmas to a plague, and it's possible that he was a god sought for deliverance from the plague. Kram was provided tribute at Samhain. We're told that they sacrificed the firstborn of everything, and this sacrifice may have included people. However, this sacrifice was the dedication of the firstborn sons and daughters to the service of the gods, not as blood victims, at least not typically. They would serve and study, and eventually become druids if they were qualified. This survives in names for legendary figures like Mognet, slave of Nyet, Mogroth, slave of the wheel, Mognuade, slave of Nuade. Early Christians continued the same practice, with children being dedicated to the church as slaves. 
Many accounts state that the Kromkruach stone gave prophecies. The life and acts of St. Patrick states, That is the head of all the gods, for that it was by that foolish people accounted to utter responses. The two lives of St. Patrick states, Now the king and the whole people used to adore this idol, in which lurked a very bad demon, who used to give answer to the people, wherefore they worshipped him as a god. Several other stones in Ireland were believed to give oracular responses. An idol called Kermund Keshtach, the Lying Riddler, was located in the Clochar Cathedral. The Martyrology of Angus states, Clochar, an assembly or a stone around which was gold, which the heathens worshipped. Out of it a devil used to speak. Kermand Keshtach was his name, and it was the chief idol of the north, that is, the short stone on thy right as you enter the temple of Clochar, and the places of the joints of gold and silver still remain in it, as we have seen. The name attached to the idol is a Christian invention, one to mock the god linked to prophecy, one tale from Man says that before Conchovar Magnessa became king, he consulted the idol of Clochar. Both Kerman Keshach and Krom Du are called the chief idols. Both give prophecies, both are gold and silver, and both appear linked to the period of Lunasa. The entry regarding Kerman was made on August 15th, which would have been just following the annual assemblies of Lunasa which was traditionally dated by the moon following the summer solstice, and fell between two weeks before and two weeks after modern August starts, coinciding roughly with the zodiac sign of Leo. Another such stone existed at Druim Tarlem, for which a Dinshenhas entry says, There was a talking stone there since the time of the Tuatha de Danan, and a demon used to give answer from it. He used to tell everyone to halt at it, to worship him, so that everyone who passed by used to dismount at it and worship him. Dream Tarlem means hill of the descent, likely descent from the sky. The word is sometimes used by Christians to refer to angels or the spirit of God coming down from heaven. The hill represented a place where a god of the sky descended to earth and his presence was centralized upon a stone. King Khan of the Hundred Battles was said to have died there. The most famous prophetic stone, however, was the Liefal. It was named one of the four treasures brought by the Tuatha de Danann, which would cry out beneath the foot of the rightful king. It was first held by Lul, and then passed on to Ervon and his progeny. The most detailed account of the workings of this stone is contained in the tale The Skull's Frenzy, involving Khan Kechasach, Khan of the Hundred Battles. Early in the morning, Khan went out onto the royal rampart of Tawir before sunrise, together with his three druids, his three filith, for that company used to arise every day to keep watch, lest the men of the Shither capture Ireland without his noticing. It is unto the rampart that he used to always go, and he chanced upon a stone beneath his feet and trod upon it. The stone cried out beneath his feet, so that it was heard throughout all Tawir and beyond Brega. Then Khan asked his druid why the stone had cried out, what was its name, whence had it come, and whether it would go, and why it had come to Tawir. Then the druid said, Fal is the name of the stone. It is the island of Fal from which it was brought. It is in Tower, the land of Fal, that it has been placed. It is in the land of Taltu that it will remain until the day of judgment. And it is in that land that there will be a festive assembly for as long as there is a kingship in Tower, and the ruler who does not find it on the last day of the assembly will be a doomed man in that year. Fal cried out beneath your feet today, said the druid, and prophesy the number of cries which the stone uttered is the number of kings there will be in your race until the day of judgment. It is not I who will name them to you. The druid is speaking of the festival of Lunasa, and he describes cult activity 
that involved the High King and the stone upon the final day of the festival. The shout of the stone may well have been thunder. In a text translated by Saint Bede from Gaelic, the sound of thunder at dawn means the birth of a king. Then they saw a great mist around them, so that they did not know whether they were going, because of the greatness of the darkness which had come upon them. They heard the thunder of a horseman coming toward them. Woe to us, said Khan, if he brings us into an unknown land. Then the horsemen made three spear casts at them, and the last came up to them more quickly than the first. He is setting out to wound a king, whoever makes a cast at Khan in Tower, cried the druid. Then the horsemen ceased his casting and came up to them, and bade Khan welcome, and invited him to come with him to his dwelling. They went on until they came into a great plain, and a sacred golden tree was there before the ramparts of the fortress. There was a palace there with a ridgepole of electrum, thirty feet in length. They went into the palace and saw a young woman there, and a crown of gold was on her head. There was a silver vat with hoops of gold around it, full of red ale. There was a dipper of gold on its lip, and a cup of gold before her. They saw the skull himself in the house, before them on his throne. There was never entowered a man of his size or his beauty, on account of the fairness of his form and the wondrousness of his appearance. My name is Lug, son of Ethriel, son of Tyrmas. This is why I have come, to relate to you the length of your reign, and of every reign which there will be in Tower. Lug is here named the grandson of Tyrmas, the same Tyrmas linked to the worship of Krom Kruach, a name possibly meaning Pillar Lord. The Leofal appears to have been hidden and revealed only on the last day of Lunasa. The stone was connected to the legitimacy of the king and a symbol of his divine election. Like the stone of Krom Du, gave forth prophecy, and that prophecy came from Lug. In Britain, there was a similar cult practice around Lunasa that involved a stone. The life of Saint Samson says, The saint was traveling through a certain district, which they call Tricurius, Trigshire in Cornwall. When he heard, on his left hand to be exact, men worshipping a certain idol, after the custom of the Bacchantes, by means of a play in honor of an image, quietly descending from his chariot, he observed those who worshipped the idol, and saw in front of them, resting on the summit of a certain hill, an abominable image. On this hill I myself have been, and with my hand have traced, the sign of the cross which Saint Samson, with his own hand carved by means of an iron instrument on a sanding stone. When Saint Samson saw it, he hastened toward them, their chief, Guedianus, standing at their head, and gently admonished them that they ought not to forsake the one God who created all things and worship an idol. And when they pleaded as excuse that it was not wrong to celebrate the mysteries of their progenitors in a play, some being furious, some mocking, but some in the saner mind strongly urging him to go away. But then a certain boy, driving a horse at full speed, fell from the horse to the ground, and twisting his neck as he fell, remained just as he was flung, little else than a lifeless corpse. While we do not know the exact ritual, it involved the veneration of a stone idol on a hill, a mythical play led by a local chieftain or king, and horse racing. The chief who led this cult activity is named Gwydianos, a Latinized rendering of the Welsh name Gwydion, mentor of the god Say. Gwydion appears to have been equated with Mercury in Roman Britain, with an altar to Mercury Uducius, based on the same root. Samson attacks the idol of the god, carving the sign of the cross into it like St. Patrick was said to have defaced Crom but he overthrows the worship of the idol in order to place himself and his god in its place. After performing a miracle and turning the people away from the veneration of the idol, it's revealed the reason they were practicing the ancient rites had to do with a dragon that was destroying the fields and towns. Saint Samson takes the god's place by combating this dragon. His feast day, celebrated in Brittany and Wales, is July 28th. Many mountains and hills are connected to Krom du Sunday, along with holy wells and springs, 
and to this day, many people participate in hill climbs, often in connection with St. Patrick. Slave Kallen was one such location where Lunasa gatherings were held under the name of Kromdu. While some antiquarian frauds invented evidence for a direct connection between the ancient rituals and the sun, including a fake Oum inscription, there likely was a genuine solar aspect to the festival. Another well-known Lunasa mountain is Crow Patrick. The Dinshenhaus entry for Crow Patrick, originally called Kruichen Eigle, mentions a wife of Lu, Baren, meaning a rocky hill. She died at Kruichen Eigle and serves as an origin story for the creation of the mountain. Lug's daughter, Cleara Ketach, of the poetic troupe of hundreds, was killed there by Eigle and avenged by Kromderg, son of Konra. The mountain is associated with a solar event corresponding to late August and April, where the sun appears to roll down the mountain when viewed from the Boha stone, a Neolithic stone later Christianized as Patrick's chair. The mountain ascent is part of an ancient ritual, which was concerned with defending the crops and people against encroaching harmful beings called the Fomorians. They are the equivalent of the giants, the Jotnar, the trolls, the Asuras, the Divs, and so on. These harmful forces are described in the story of Karma. They spread blight, drought, plague, and darkness. The act of climbing the hill is a ritually supportive action toward the god or gods who battle against these beings. Saint Samson combats a dragon of plague and drought on Lunasa. Saint Macriche, the son of plunder, battles a plague monster, perhaps not coincidentally named Krom Honel, by shooting fire from his bell. Saint Molassius, called the Ruddy Lightning Flame, defeats a plague on Lunasa and causes an oak tree to come to life and grab the horse of a king. The hilltop climb of Kromdu Sunday is also preserved in Scottish folklore. The land comes under the assault of the Thunder Hag, who despite the name actually causes drought. The champion, Conal Corlew, is asked to defeat her, and to do so he climbed a tall hill and hurled his spear at her, causing the wheels of the chariot to break the clouds and release the rain. The casting of the spear from a hill at the clouds is surprisingly similar to accounts of Thracians shooting arrows at the clouds to drive off bad spirits. It is an action believed to be carried out in support of the lightning wielder, who slays the cloud demons. Such is found famously in the tale of Indra's destruction of Vertra. It's possible that the ancient Gaels and Britons enacted such rituals, of which some elements survive in folklore. This is also seen in the Welsh tale that contains both a hill ascent, a standing stone, and a magical spear. In the story of the Mabinogi, Math son of Mathonwi, when Thay comes of age, Gwyrion and Math create a woman for him made out of flowers and call her at first Lodaith, flowers. Math gives him rule over the region of Dinodic, and he resides in the fortress of Mir Ekastes, known now as Tomenimir. It was a Roman period fortress, one of the best preserved Roman sites in Wales, emphasizing Shay's martial nature. When he was away, Blodaeth falls in love with Gronu Peber, a name meaning bright crane, and together they plot Shay's death. It was a hard task given that he is practically invincible. But the method was discovered and Gronu spends a year making a spear that will kill him. Lodaeth tells Gronu to hide in ambush on Bryn Kevergir, meaning the hill of conflict. And when she has Shay stand atop a goat and the side of his tub, Gronu rises up from the hill and casts a spear down. The spear lodges in Shay's side, and he transforms into an eagle and flies away. Gwydion searches all over for him, but eventually finds him by following a sow to the bottom of an oak tree in Nant Say. There is an eagle upon the tree as flesh is flaking off and being eaten by the pig, strongly suggesting that Say's flesh is acorns, typical foraging fodder for swine. Gwydion sings to him, 
Oak that grows between two lakes, dark be the sky in the glen. If I do not tell a lie, from the flower of Thay this has come. Oak that grows in upland ground, no rain falls, not a drip. Nine score wraths it endures. On its summit, Thothau Guffis. Grows an oak upon a steep, the sanctuary of a fair lord. Unless I speak falsely, Thay will come down into my lap. After being rescued from this state, Thay musters the armies and returns to get revenge. Gronu soon submits and Thay commands him to stand where he stood and he will go atop the hill and cast a spear at him in return. Gronu, after failing to find anyone to take the blow for him, begs for mercy and Thay agrees that he can stand behind the stone. Yet when Thay casts a spear, it cuts straight through the stone and strikes Gronu dead. A hold stone called the Thechronu is still to be found not far from the location described in the tale. Many elements of the Lunasa ritual are contained in this story. A hill climb, a standing stone, a woman of flowers, and the casting of a spear. We can compare this to other examples of sacred stones in Europe. In Rome, stones or even patches of ground struck by lightning were considered holy to Jupiter. The spear with the potential to break stone is the lightning bolt. In the Temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill was the Stone of Jupiter. Oaths were sworn upon this stone, especially concerning treaties oaths of major significance to the state. In the oldest account of Lug's birth, the Tuatha De and the Fomorians decide to make a treaty of friendship. To secure this alliance, Cian of the Tuatha De is wed to Ethnu, daughter of Balor. This wedding shows that Cian was originally viewed as the prince or king of the Tuatha De, as he is presented in folk tales rather than most medieval accounts that diminish his role for such a marriage alliance would only have been made between the highest nobility. The son of that marriage of alliance was Lu, a name possibly derived from the word oath. Other Lunasa traditions suggest that hold stones were related to the making of oaths, among other things, including marriage vows. In the earliest records of the Rus, we see that Perun, the god of thunder and sky, was also called upon to witness oaths. In the Irish folktale Ellen Gau and the Glas Gaunach, Cian, who loses Ellen Gau's hard won cow, strives to retrieve her. In the process, he wins the hand of the daughter of the King of Spain. The two have a son who they name Cormac. When Cian returns to Ireland with the cow, he is waylaid by three bandits who turn him into a pillar stone with a magic rod and the cow into a mound. Years later, his son grows up and seeks out his father. He runs across the same three bandits and uses his martial power to overcome them. After killing the three, he uses the rod to return Kian and the cow back to their normal form. Though called Cormac, this is the same figure as Lug. The folktale is likely connected to the late medieval tale called The Fate of the Children of Turin. The three sons of Turin are about to kill Kian. But he warns the killers that their weapons will tell the tale to Lu. They then decide to kill him with stones, assuming that they will not speak, since it was believed that weapons could speak. After pelting him to death with stones, it takes seven attempts to bury him. After Lu has routed the Fomorian forces, he senses something terrible has happened and comes to find Kian. The earth speaks to him and tells him about the murder, and Lu reburies his father placing a standing stone above him. As recompense, he extracts many powerful artifacts from the sons of Turin, called the Gods of Art, including the fiery spear that comes back to the hand when called, goats that can be eaten and will revive the next day, and horses unharmed by winds, waves, or lightning. One version of the taking of Ireland makes the following connection between Gaelic and Greek mythology. Lug Lavada had three sons, Anla, Avarthach, and Knu Daryog, little nut. Savran, daughter of Avarthach, 
son of Luglavada, wife of Cal the Hundred Wounder, son of Lugith of Leda, Helen of Leda, wife of Alexander, son of Priam, son of Laomedon, was mother of Savran, daughter of Avertach. Helen of Leda is better known as Helen of Troy, who the writer claims was a lover of Lug's son and mother of his granddaughter. Yet Helen's brother, instead of being called Castor or Polyduces, is called Lugith. Lug was sometimes thought of as a twin. Gaelic folklore says his brother or brothers all fell into the sea and were drowned or became seals. This accords closely with the Welsh account of the birth of Dylan, who rushes to the sea as soon as he is born. The twins always run to the sea because they're the flood, the water that bursts from the clouds and runs down to the sea. The name Dylan is from Di, meaning great, and Than, meaning flood. He is the watery, raining aspect of the Thunder God. In folk tales of the birth of Lug, the twins are sometimes shown to fall into the sea out of a sack that Kian is carrying but he drops them due to the terrible stormy weather. When the Dioscuri are called Lugith, it may be a translation of the name Dioscuri, sons of Zeus, equated with the name Lugith meaning one devoted to Lug. In other accounts, Lug's feats are compared to Heracles. The fact that Lug is a thunder god should not be surprising, but for the layer upon layer of confusion that has been spread first by Christians intentionally confusing the mythical tales, then antiquarians obsessed with solar worship, and all of these things being compounded later with the obsession of trying to link deities to one single statement made by Julius Caesar. Lug is always remembered as the god who defeated the Fomorians and drove the corrupted ones from Taur, a feat in every tradition linked to the thunder god. He is most often called Lon, meaning fierce, Lon Biemnach, fierce striker, Lon Anschlech, fiercely combative, Lug Laich, warrior Lug, Lugith Nalaich Brethe, of the warrior law, Luichdacht, of the warrior art, Biemen Balchtrin, of the powerfully strong blows, and he is also sometimes called Delvith, fire form, and Daira, oak wood. Because he is sometimes called Ildanach or Sam Ildanach, many people have tried to equate him with Mercury, despite the titles also being given to the Dagda and to other historical high kings. His father in both traditions does possess Mercury-like qualities, having great magical skills, represented as a triple figure, a shapeshifter who could move invisibly, but Lug is never described in this way. The title Samil Danach is given to many high kings and shows their superior status in a hierarchy that is developed through skills and particular arts. The one who possesses all the arts is the one who rules over all of the others. High kings called Samil Danach are not called this because they are master craftsmen. They are called this as a sign of superiority. Lug's tales involve battle and the issuing of legal judgments, as befits the role of High King. He seldom appears in human-centered stories, but when he does, his powers are described in the following example from the Tanbo Kulnya. The torches of the war goddess, the virulent rain clouds, the sparks of blazing fire, were seen in the clouds and in the air above his head with the seething of fierce rage that rose above him. Then he performs the thunder feet of a hundred, and the thunder feet of two hundred, and the thunder feet of three hundred, and the thunder feet of four hundred. And he stopped at the thunder feet of five hundred, for he thought that at least that number should fall by him in his first attack, and in his first contest in battle against the four provinces of Ireland. And he came forth in this manner to attack his enemies, and took his chariot in a wide circuit, outside the four great provinces of Ireland, and he drove the chariot heavily. The iron wheels of the chariot sank deep into the ground, so that the manner in which they sank into the ground left furrows sufficient to provide forts and fortresses, 
for there are roads on the outside as high as the iron wheels, dikes and boulders and rocks and flagstones and gravel from the ground. People say that Lug Mac Ethnew fought beside Cuchulain in that battle. In the Battle of Mug Turret, Lug makes reference to the power of the burning heavens, thunder giving birth. To your fields, my flood, my craft, my skill of the tribe. His floods will force the Fomorians beneath the dark, stormy waves of the sea, which, however, will not harm him. And he extols the power of the sea to grind down the Fomorians. He calls upon howling winds, cries of dragons, flashes of fire, light of sun and radiance of moon before striking down Balor. Folklore of Loch Nasul says that a tear fell from Balor's eye that created the lake, or that when Lug struck him down, his eye burned a hole in the ground and it filled with water. The lake has a particular property, that it goes empty once in a decade or two, and it's said that this reminds people why the battle against Balor was fought, suggesting it was connected to drought. Lug's main feat, in fact, one of the only things ever mentioned about him, is that he defeated the Fomorians through force of arms, and then went on to have many different disputes with other gods, in which he killed them and eventually was killed by them. And like in every other Indo-European example, the mighty weapon that slays those Fomorians can be nothing else but the Thunderbolt. In an early medieval work on prophecies made by thunder, translated from the Gaelic by St. Bede, of August it says, If thunder of the month of August thunders in the course of any year, it indicates that the fish of the sea and their offspring will die in multitudes in that year, as will the harmful army of the serpent-like race. That serpent-like race is the Fomorians, devastated by the thunder god. In Gaul we have numerous representations of exactly this. Just south of Lugdunum, modern-day Lyon, France, is a site called saint romain Egal. A Roman period Gaulish agricultural estate was excavated there, which reveals a wondrous mosaic depicting seasons and the agricultural activities that took place in each. Summer was represented by a puto riding upon a lion, with a crown of wheat in one hand and a sickle in the other. The lion represents the zodiac sign of Leo, corresponding to July and August, a traditional period of Lunasa, and the sickle and wheat represents the grain harvest that took place at this time, also a central focus of Lunasa ritual. Many panels showing the seasonal activity for this section have been destroyed, unfortunately. One surviving panel shows men competing in javelin throwing, suggestive of sporting activities. Yet the most important panel and perhaps the entire mosaic survives. It shows a man and his wife offering worship and sacrifice to a god of this season. The youthful god appears as if growing up out of the stone pillar, raising a torch in one hand and gripping a golden wheel in the other. It is a god generally identified now as Tyrannus, the Thunderer. In the region of Lugdunum, it was this god, the Wheel God, who was worshipped during Lunasa. Furthermore, his representation hints at an older form. He is almost always linked to a pillar, akin to the gold and silver idol of Crom Du atop the pillar stone. The man and woman worshipping the god both hold fabric ties, and it's curious that such fabric ties are affixed to trees near sacred wells or springs around the time of Lunasa. It may suggest that the god holds the power of binding as well as the lightning bolt. The interpretation of the wheel has been much argued over. Some believe it's a thunder wheel, others a solar wheel. Given the historical background of the symbol used by Celts and Indo-Europeans more broadly, I think that it is more likely solar. The thunder god Indra in the Rig Veda has a story about how he took the wheel from the chariot of the sun and how he rolled a wheel that was like the sun. He likewise is called the Lord of Light, and was believed to make the sun to rise. On the Gundestrup cauldron, the god holds a wheel together with what is likely a mortal warrior, 
possibly his son. Many other representations of the god show him with this young, diminutive figure, probably intended to be his mortal hero son. In the Ta'an is the following account. And he took his chariot on his back and came toward the men of Ireland, and with his chariot he smote them. Then Cuchulain's sword was given to him, and he smote a blow on the three blunt-topped hills at Athluin, and cut off their three tops. At midday Cuchulain came to that battle. At the time of sunset at the ninth hour, the last company of the men of Connacht fled in route westward over the hill. At that time there did not remain in Cuchulain's hand of the chariot, but a handful of its spokes around the wheel, and a hand breadth of its poles around the shell. In various folktales that describe the birth of a figure akin to Lug, the father must access an impossible-to-reach fortress, often connected to a golden wheel, or with golden wheels inside. When the child is born, his head has gold and silver upon it. In Welsh, Lle is the son of Arendrod. The first part of her name is disputed, but the second part certainly means wheel. Many examples of this wheel god show him mounted upon a horse, running down a chthonic serpent-like being, certainly equivalent to the Gaelic Fomorians. They represent the opposition and obstructive forces who are defeated and relegated to the depths by the ruler of thunder using his mighty weapons. Such examples can also be found in pre-Roman Celtiberia, where a horse and rider step upon a head. This is similar to the representation of Indra in the Rig Veda, who is also a master of horses. Of all the classical events of Lunasa, horse racing appears to have been the most important and held the most sacred. It was Lug who was the master of horses. He invented horse riding, horse racing, horse whips, horse combat, and was the first to ride a horse into war when he rode out against the Fomorians. The horse racing, which was central to Crom Du Sunday, was originally part of the cult activity that honored the god of horse racing and horses, and the Gaulish Jupiter is consistently shown as this horse riding warrior. Even when he is not on horseback, he is often shown as a warrior, wearing armor, holding a spear instead of a staff, and votive spears are given as offerings to him. On a ritual mace from Britain, he is shown throwing a lightning bolt in close company with the smith god. In folklore, Govnu takes a spear hot off the forge, and Lug hurls it at Balor, or else makes the spear on the forge himself. On a Heracles-style club, the top features the face of an older Roman-style Jupiter, but below him is a youthful warrior standing atop a chthonic creature, one hand holding a wheel topped by an eagle, and the other holding a lightning bolt. Behind him stands the three-horned bull, found also near Jupiter on the pillar of the boatman. The iconography leaves no room for doubt that the main identity of the Celtic Jupiter was as a warrior who smashes the Chthonic beings, the Fomorians. This corresponds exactly to Lug. Lug brings rains, floods, and storms from the sea, but he can also keep bad weather away. The Lunasa tale of Machriche displays exactly this. The saint requests a ridge of wheat from a local king and is granted it. While Makriche is on the ridge harvesting, a great storm comes carrying the crops of the king out to the sea, all except that which has been granted to the saint. After that, the king dedicates his entire kingdom to the saint so that it will be under his protection. First fruit sacrifices such as those performed at Lunasa were likewise performed in Gaul, and according to Romans, this was sometimes done alongside the burning of prisoners. We are told that sacrifices to Tyrannus were burned, and there is some evidence for burning of prisoners at the time of Lunasa. The Dagda was said to have cried tears of sorrow as he beheld the fire that consumed his son Kermit, as punishment meted out by Lug for having violated his wife. Lug is often connected with such burning, such as Londbruth Loga, the fierce burning of Lug, or included in names such as Eith Loga, Flame of Lug, 
which perhaps suggests lightning. It is said that Tyrannus was the lord of war and was the sovereign, and that in the past he would sacrifice humans, but that at present he was satisfied with the sacrifice of cattle. The theme of wife theft and revenge and a struggle against opposing factions of gods can also be found in Slavic myth with Perun and Veles. The latter frequently steals the cows of Perun and is killed in response. Often the wife of Lu, who is carried off by Kermit, is Bui or Buach, whose name refers to a cow, Bo. She was said to possess a white, red-eared cow that became the island of Inish Boy. Continuing the cattle theft and recovery theme which initiated his conception in folklore. A ritual took place that involved the spreading of flowers upon hilltop and a dramatic reenactment with a standing stone. At least at Tower, this seems to have involved the king having to find the Leofal, but elsewhere it may have involved the retelling of the god triumphantly returning from death to overthrow a usurper who had taken his wife. Often the tale of Lug is compared to that of Perseus, but it likewise corresponds to Zeus. He is hidden away after his birth and returns to lead the gods in war, in which his thunder weapon is the decisive instrument of victory over his father. Zeus is then defeated by Typhon and has to be rescued and returned by Hermes, akin perhaps to Say's experience upon the oak tree. The tale of the court of Krynaun is perhaps a more plain folk interpretation of Lug. A plague is devastating Ireland, and it's discovered that in the fort of Krynaun there is a cure for the plague. People flock there, but thunder and lightning are coming from within and everyone is too afraid. They try to recruit priests to help, but most of them are too afraid as well. Finally, a few brave ones arrive. The thunder and lightning stop, and Krunaun comes out to greet them. He has one eye in the middle of his forehead, and declares that he is the son of Balor, but that he will not harm them, and he likes brave men. He gives them money and tells them to help people with it. The cowardly priests who had refused to come earlier then go and demand money from him, or else they will drive him from Ireland. And he laughs at their threats, declaring that he is more powerful than all the priests of Ireland put together, and they can go home and see a bit of his power that night. That night a storm wind comes and lifts the roofs from their houses. They beg forgiveness, and he blows a blast of wind from his nose, and it lifts the roofs back onto their houses. That he is called the son of Balor, rather than grandson is in keeping with another folk account where thunderstorms are called a battle between Lug and his father Balor. The stone of Krom Du is connected to the worship of Lug, who is the Gaelic equivalent of the Gaulish wheel god, for which there is archaeological proof for his worship at the same time of year connected with the grain harvest. The pillar stone may be the equivalent of the Gaulish pillar upon which the idol of the god was placed. Lug's occasional twin identity stems from the link between lightning and rains, with his brother or brothers representing the floods that flowed down from the clouds, rushing to the seas, but also bestowing their energy into the plants. He wasn't only a master of the thunderbolt, but he also brought the sun. As a god of the sky, he is fiery and bright, more luminous than the sun. It's possible that he is connected with such stones due to lightning strikes that hit them in the past, and that this idea is taken over by the myth of Patrick, who claims to have extended his staff toward the idol and caused it to be struck over and lean. However, like with Jupiter, such stones were sacred to the god. Zeus oversees oaths, Jupiter oversees oaths, Perun oversees oaths, and Lug's name may originate from Oath. The folk account of Patrick's struggle against Krom is a legacy of over a thousand years of Christians struggling to replace the old gods who were previously honored on the day. It may contain fragments of an earlier tale, but primarily it tries to explain certain customs that had survived when the memory of the original purpose of the festival had died. The name Krom Du or Krom Kruach 
was just a Christian way of referring to the idol without using its actual pagan name and invoking a pagan god. Instead, we see tale after tale of such stones being connected to Lug in various ways, for whom the festival of Lunasa was originally named, dressed in his fiery armor, and so bright he could not be looked upon without squinting. He smote down the Fomorians with his lightning spear. He was the progenitor of many of the Gaelic tribes, and was especially a god of war and horsemanship, with his spear deciding the victory of armies. He was asked to oversee the fields during the harvest to protect them from destruction. But he would have also been looked to for the various kings who were holding the festivals to grant signs of their rightful rule. One of the biggest signs that he could send was a successful harvest. A failed harvest meant the king had erred and had lost the support of the gods. St. Patrick does take over Luke's position during Lunasa, as did other local saints. Of St. Patrick, the Dinchenhas for Bri Grege says, When Loigara MacNeil, King of Ireland, went to Ferta Fair Feke to meet Patrick, there came, through the miraculous power of Patrick, great thunderings and lightnings, so that all the studs of Erin were thrown into a panic. It says in the life of Patrick, but the queen besought Patrick not to curse the child that was in her womb, namely Lugis, son of Loigara. Patrick said, I will not curse till he opposes me. Now Lugis took the realm of Ireland, and thereafter he came to Achid Farcha, and there he said, Is it not that the church of the clerics said there would never be a king or crown prince of our seed? Swifter than speech, a bolt of fire was hurled against him and killed him. He is named for the god of lightning, but is killed by lightning. The place name, Achit Farcha, means the field of lightning. It almost certainly predates Christianity. That a tale would be told of a high king named Lugith, devotee of Lug, being killed by lightning on the field of lightning, suggests that in earlier times the site was dedicated to Lug. For the most part, the annual festival was concerned with honoring the goddess of the fields who takes on the name of the local area, honoring the dead who likewise hold sway over crops, and asking for the intervention of Lug's power to avert evil forces and ensure weather for the successful harvest. The theme of the lost wife, the downfall and return, seems to be a common theme with ruling deities and has parallels in stories of Zeus and Odin. It is possible that Nasat actually comes from the Indo-European root Ness, meaning a safe return, and refers to Lug's return and triumph, eventually evolving to mean an assembly for the festivals that were held to commemorate it. The exact details of the ritual cannot in any way be accurately reconstructed, and it likely differs regionally. But in at least one case, the stone is struck by the spear of the god, passes through it, and kills one behind it. Similar to that of Thor's battle with Gerother, the hill climbing was possibly a supportive action to spiritually aid the god, and atop many mountains, Lug was said to have slain Fomorians. Like Thor, Lug was looked to as a protector of the land, and this element is emphasized in Cúhullan. Cromdu Sunday is the same as the celebration of Lunasa, simply masked behind a Christianized name, and late folktales derived from a fictional Christian account spread widely by the church in order to undermine the pagan nature of the celebration. Unfortunately, it largely succeeded, and views widely disseminated by antiquarians and others have further confused efforts to understand the origins and gods involved. Kramdu was never the name of a god, but a Christian description of a stone. Lug is connected to that stone, and is also the same as the Gaulish wheel god, who is worshipped at Lunasa, and to whom the first fruits and cattle were sacrificed. The lord of war and the ruler of the powers of heaven, well, I hope you liked the video, and if you did, please like, share, subscribe, and consider supporting me 
on Patreon or PayPal. It takes a long time to make these productions, and your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you all for listening, and as always, stand tall.